Okay, this is the Unit 13 presentation on contemporary American theater. So we have traditional theater that came from the Greeks and all the way up through thousands of years, and then we have avant-garde theater, which is really pushing the rules of theater. So traditional theater follows the patterns of plays from the past in structure, theme, and approach, like Sam Shepard, David Mamet, Horton Foote are playwrights that are still done in the traditional sense. Then you have avant-garde and experimental theater, which challenges preconceived ideas about drama. So happenings is a phrase, a uh, term that's actually an official term from the 60s and 70s, events, theatrical events, um, getting a crowd together and just telling some stories and not making a big deal out of it. Multimedia, using a lot of sound and images. Environmental theater, which basically means you turn any kind of a space into a theater. You just add audience and performers, and boom, you have a theater space. It could be in a park, it could be in a warehouse, wherever you want to do it. And poor theater is along the same lines. Poor theater had is an official term, which was a movement that, um, that believed that all you need is people and audience. All you need is actors and audience. You don't need costumes. You don't need lots of fancy scenery and music. You can just tell the story with your bodies and your voice. And so that was, it sounds very simple, but for some reason that was pushing tradition. Postmodernism and diversity. Um, Postmodern is a word we've heard before. And again, the, the difference between modern and contemporary is an important one. Those words are used interchangeably, but really they're very different. Modern and modernism refer to the early 20th century. Um, contemporary refers to whatever's happening now. So if somebody tells you, oh, that dress looks really modern, it's kind of an insult because they're saying it's really old-fashioned. So modern meaning 20th century, contemporary meaning now. So postmodernism is when you're starting to get into the middle of the 20th century and you're pushing these ideas that came before. So it's anti-modern. It's rebelling against tradition. It's deconstruction of classics, which means you take stories apart and you put them back together in different ways to see how they look different. A mix of styles and traditions in a single work, like the Worcester Group is very famous for this in New York. You can see that picture there of a performance, um, and it looks very strange. You think, what's going on there? Well, they're deconstructing. They're taking things apart, putting them back together in different ways to try to make sense. So how would you define postmodernism? If you're going to push tradition... What does that mean to you? And think about how can diversity benefit from such work? Diversity, you know, groups that aren't normally represented, how could they use the idea of pushing tradition to get their messages out? So when we talk about diversity, we're talking about various movements of performance that address multicultural, multi-ethnic, or gender-related issues. And a lot of these developed in the 60s and 70s during social rights movements, um, to express social and political concerns of marginalized groups. The development of diversity in performance continues to grow and thrive in American culture. It continues to run up against barriers as well. And I would like you to read the Guthrie article that I put in the lecture materials. Um, this is a very interesting article that just came out about the Guthrie's new season for 2012 and 2013. A lot of people think that this big regional theater in America isn't doing enough about diversity and women's issues. So it's still a debate we're having. Let's talk about African-American theater. Um, two roots in African-American theater, Western theater traditions blending with African and Caribbean performance traditions. So you're mixing these styles together to bring out these stories. A lot of barriers for black performers in the 20th century, the cultural stereotypes that they were playing, um, a lot of times they were only delegated to servant roles. There were minstrel performances where white actors would put on black makeup, which is actually illegal now, um, but they did that to keep these stereotypes going um, and because they didn't have uh, access to having black performers on stage. So these were some barriers, but they kept pushing and they kept doing it and they kept doing their own thing. And now there's a lot going on. So early African-American theater companies are the African Grove Theater in the early 20th century and the Lafayette Players. There's actually the African Grove Theater still going on. The new African Grove Theater's latest production is called Gem of the Ocean. It's August Wilson. Um, you see that picture there. So uh, very well established. Another thing that happened was the Federal Theater Project in the 1930s, which helped build the new generation of African-American theater performers and artists. And, um, of course, Lorraine Hansberry, one of the key playwrights who helped this movement, A Raisin in the Sun, in 1959, a very tumultuous time. Um, so she was writing about issues that were very important, and people started to notice. 
And then we have August Wilson, Amira Baraka, and Suzanne Lowry Parks, who's in the photo on the right, on the upper right. She's a very famous playwright right now and has a very pretty recent play called Top Dog Underdog, which was on Broadway about issues. Um, so very, very famous. And then if, when you think about Asian American theater, we have very rich heritage of performance traditions from three Eastern cultures, India, China, and Japan. Amazing traditions um, in performance, acrobatics, dance, opera, puppetry that are still being influenced today and still influencing American theater and Asian American theater. They're very, uh, it's very important to them that the background must be acknowledged as a formative in developing the American version of Asian theater. So think about your own background for a second. What does that contribute to your understanding of performance? Because again, you have people from all different cultures in America, uh, and all kinds of different traditions, and it's definitely going to influence the way we do things here. When we talk about contemporary Asian, Asian American theater, um, there's still difficulty challenging cultural stereotypes in the 60s and 70s. The awareness started growing, and some of these theater companies listed here were big in getting these issues across. The most famous was David Henry Wang, who wrote M. Butterfly, about an American businessman who goes to um, China and falls in love with an opera singer who turns out to be a man. Um, it's a very beautiful play. And Flower Drum Song, so very famous stuff. And Hispanic theater is very important. Um, Chicano theater, Cuban-American theater, and Nairokian theater, uh, Puerto Rican. Amazing stories about love, relationships, friendships, business, work, family. Maria Irene Fornes is one of the most prominent Hispanic playwrights. And Native American theater, which isn't very much in the spotlight, but it deals it has to deal with stereotypes of either subhuman or superhuman. They have to fight against those barriers. They have a huge ritual tradition and communal celebration as ground for theater. So again, a lot of these ancient um, performance traditions can creep their way into American theater. Native American Theater Ensemble is a group and Spider Woman Theater. Um, they're still struggling for recognition and acceptance. And then feminist theater, we've talked a little bit about before, evolves from the struggle for women's rights in the 60s and 70s. Um, some of the early women playwrights, it's not like, you know, women just started writing plays in the 60s and 70s. They've been doing it for a long time, um, but just generally not very well represented. Some of the more contemporary ones in the 20th century, Sophie Treadwell, Lillian Hellman, are still writing about it. And again, I, I encourage you to read that Guthrie article because it talks about how women are just in general, very underrepresented as playwrights and directors. But some of the more modern feminist playwrights in the 20th century were Marina, Maria Irene Fornes, again, Beth Henley, Crimes of the Heart, that middle picture there, was also turned into a movie, um, Marsha Norman's Night Mother, Wendy Wasserstein's The Heidi Chronicles, Carol Churchill, Top Girls and Cloud Nine, and Paula Vogel, How I Learned to Drive, that's the lower right-hand corner, very, very powerful play about um, sexual abuse and family, you know, secrets and things like that. So a lot of fem female issues coming to the front. And then gay and lesbian theater, very important, um, really got started in the late 60s up through the 80s and continues today. It was a distinct movement with historical threads, a lot of cross-dressing, veiled references to sexual preference at first, and then we have The Boys in the Band in 1968, which was much more connected to the beginning of the modern gay rights movement, so becoming more culturally accepted to tell their stories. Some of the major playwrights, Terrence McNally with Love, Valor, Compassion, which is also a very good movie, Harvey Fierstein, Torch Song Trilogy, Larry Kramer, The Normal Heart, an amazing play, um, Tony Kushner's Angels in America, uh, which is a play you're going to be reading, and it brings up a lot of questions of gender bending, social issues, gay AIDS, gay rights. There's a character who's a lawyer, there's politicians, there's all kinds of interesting characters. And as you're reading it, consider the choices that the playwright makes um, in putting, um, a asking for different roles to be played by the opposite gender and why he wanted to do that. And political theater is a pretty broad term, but it refers to any type of theater that brings up political issues in a kind of slanted way um, or just tries to bring political issues to the forefront and see what people think of them. So they definitely concern themselves with political ideas, causes, and individuals. And in the U.S., this increased 
dramatically during the time of the Vietnam War, which you can imagine. Megan Terry wrote Viet Rock. There's a picture of that on the right. Barbara Garson, McBird, and Hair, which is a musical, also made into a film about characters, uh, one particular character who gets um, sent to Vietnam and, and gets killed and how that affects his friends. Um, other examples, Eve Ensler wrote the Vagina Monologues, and a lot of that is just monologues taken from actual interviews with women all around the world about female health and perception about sexuality and things like that, which is very, very powerful. Um, the Treatment, she also wrote, and Lawrence Wright wrote My Trip to Al-Qaeda. So there's all kinds of <laughs> possibilities, and the list could go on and on about plays that deal with issues that are, you know, powerful to people. Performance art is a very broad term we've mentioned before with postmodernism. It's a common method for diversity theater to manifest itself, but not tied to any particular diverse population. It can be used in any population. Um, Avant-garde experiments obviously influenced performance art. Arto and Jerry Grotowski, they were very focused on the body, the actor's body telling the story. Jackson Pollock, you see a picture of him there. He's an artist who did all kinds of funky stuff. And the happenings of the 50s and 60s. Again, artists would get together. They would, you know, really influence themselves with all different kinds of art together in one place, music and sound and paint, and see what would happen, see what kind of story would come out of that. Another type of performance art is a little bit more organized, and it's more of self-expression with a particular agenda, usually solo pieces that are tied to expressions of art, dance, or theater, the body, etc. And there's some lists of names of people you might recognize. Anna Devere Smith is a very popular one. Um, she, she's an actress you might recognize from TV and film, but she does a lot of things where she'll interview people from certain neighborhoods or from a certain disaster that happened or something like that, and then she will take on their persona in a monologue and tell their story. And she has a lot of series of performances where she does this. Um, you know, for, she'll go into a, a neighborhood in Brooklyn, for example, and interview the Jews that live there and then tell their stories. So um, that's another type of performance art. So this is the last slide. Think about this for a second. Do you see evidence of diversity in the theater around you? And what types of groups do you feel would be well served by a theatrical movement? Maybe there's, you know, a group of immigrants in your neighborhood that um, need to get their stories told. Um, yeah, so think about that as you go through your journey. This is the end of the presentation.